everyone. Welcome to the Alpine Cider YouTube channel. My name is Michael. I'm gonna be talking today about what I take for a day of ski touring. So a little bit about me. I live in Bellingham, Washington in the Pacific Northwest. I'll talk about how my gear is sort of really tailored to the conditions we have here. It tends to be a little bit warmer. Uh, I tend to be personally really interested in ski mountaineering, so big, long days, moving light and fast. And so you'll see that really reflected in the gear I'm gonna talk about today. To start things off, uh, I'll show you my skis. These are the Black Diamond Helio Carbon with a 95 waist. Um, I really like these skis for a wide range of conditions. They perform well, whether it's wind crust or hard pack. Uh, they do okay in powder. They're not as playful as other skis, but they perform really well, kind of no matter what you throw at them. The other thing I really like about these skis is that they're really light on the uphill. These are one of the lighter skis out there where you're not going down to sort of a ski mountaineering racing ski, something that looks more like a cross country ski. I think these are a really great option if you're interested in ski mountaineering. If you're more interested in chasing after powder and having fun, playful surfing in the snow, I recommend something like the Solomon QST series or the G3 Seeker. So I have these mounted with Markinus, Marker Alpinus 12 bindings. For the price, I think these are one of the better bindings out there, tech bindings. They're they're relatively light, they're not the lightest binding out there, and they're relatively hard charging, they're not the chargiest binding out there. But if you want a lighter or a harder charger binding, you're going to pay just about twice as much. So I think these are a really good option for anyone who doesn't have unlimited money to spend on ski gear. So I pair these skis with the Black Diamond Ascensionist Nylon Skins. What I really like about the nylon skins is that they do pretty well in wet conditions, particularly in the spring here in the Pacific Northwest, it tends to get really sloppy out there. And the nylon holds up really well against that. I also like Black Diamond's glue quite a bit. The downside to the nylon skin is that it doesn't glide as well, particularly in cold powdery conditions. If you live somewhere like Colorado or the Northern Rockies, where you have a lot colder temperatures, much more powdery snow, mohair or a hybrid skin is gonna work a lot better for you. Something like the Pomoka Pro Glide S works really well for those types of conditions. So in terms of my poles, I can't say I've ever found a really great pair of ski poles. These are the Lecky Hot Routes. They're fine, you know? I'm not gonna say these are the poles you should go out and buy. They work relatively well. What I don't like about them is that they only have one buckle closure here. So this is about as far as they close down. That's still pretty long if you're planning to carry these on, the back, on your back. And then I'll talk about my boots. These are the Atomic Backlands. There's the Backland Pro and the Backland Carbon version as well. These are a little bit older than either of those. I really like this pair of boots. They're extremely comfortable. They're extremely flexible, which is great if you're walking around in them a lot, like I tend to be in the spring. I've hiked on trails in dirt for many miles in these before you get to the snow. They feel really comfortable. I'm not dying to get out of my ski boots by the time I hit snow line. The downside to these boots is that they're really flexible. And so if you're looking to do a really big line and you want boots that you can really lean forward into, these are gonna give a little bit. They're not gonna hold you up like a downhill boot. So something like the Technica Zero G, you add a lot of weight to the boot, but you're also gonna get a lot more support for hard charging lines. So that's something to really think about when you're evaluating boots is whether you want something that's gonna you know, feel like a downhill boot, which is not the backland, it's more like the Technica Zero G, or if you want something that's gonna be really light and uh, comfortable on the uphill, which is the backland. So I'll talk about my uh, Avalanche gear. My beacon is the BCA Tracker 3. This is sort of a basic standard three antenna beacon. It's really affordable, it's really easy to use, it's really easy to read the display when you're in search mode. It just Basic Beacon does everything well. Uh, they just came out the Tracker 4 recently. I haven't tried it out yet. Excited to look at that next season. One thing to keep in mind, there are still some two antenna beacons out there, and I'd really urge you to stay away from those. They're being phased out across the backcountry community. A lot of companies have buybacks to actually get those off the market. The two antenna beacons, they just don't search as well as the three antenna beacons. And so it's really worth spending the extra 50, 60 bucks to get something that's newer technology and works a lot better in an emergency situation. My probe and shovel aren't anything special here. It's a G3 shovel, pretty generic. One thing I like is that it has a big wide shovel head. You can move a fair bit of snow with this shovel without taking up a ton of space or weight. But other than that, there's nothing really special about this. Any shovel or probe will do in the backcountry. My probe is the Volet Torlight. 
this is a, the only thing I'd say about this is it's a three meter probe. In the Northwest, we have a really deep snowpack. Uh, so having three meters of length in your probe is actually pretty important. If you live somewhere with a shallower snowpack, like say Colorado, Utah, Montana, a two meter probe might be enough for you. Another piece of gear I wanna talk about is my backpack. This is the Ordovox Peak 45. And I absolutely love this backpack. I actually have another one sitting in the closet because I wanted to buy another version in case they ever stop making this. There's just a lot to say about this pack. I'll start with the Avalanche pocket in the front here. So this opens up and there's spots in here for your shovel and probe. They just slot right in here, really easy to access if you need them in an emergency. Behind that, what I really like is this J-zip that runs all the way down the length of the pack. So let's say you've got all your stuff shoved in here and you realize you need your down coat from the bottom of the pack. Now you don't have to take everything out and throw in the snow, which here in the Northwest means getting it all wet. Instead, you can open this up, open your pack like a suitcase, and then get in there, get your jacket, get whatever you need out of the bottom, close it back up, easy. Really, really nice to have that feature. In the spring, for more ski mountaineering adventures where you're carrying your skis for a long period, the A-frame on this pack works really well. It also has a strap for a diagonal carry, uh, for quicker carries. You know, you can put on ice axes, ice tools on the front here. Just everything about this pack is really well designed, works really well for a wide variety of conditions. This is a 45 liter pack. They make it in smaller versions as well. I like the 45 liter because I can use it for everything from casual day tours, and I'll have a little extra space in there, to multi-day uh, mountaineering trips. I've taken this on a week-long trip, tent, seven days of food, the whole deal, uh, with skis, and was able to pack it in this pack. So. There's a lot of space in that 45 liters. The last thing I would say about this is it has a wool back panel, which, you know, there's a little bit of marketing to that, but having a back panel that just doesn't just absorb sweat and hold it against your back for days on end is really nice. A little bit about some odds and ends that I always carry in my pack here. So, of course, sunglasses, just in case. If the sun comes out, you wanna protect your eyes. Bars, I always have a ton of bars in my pack. I can eat a lot of food, and it's always nice to know that I'm not gonna run out. Headlamp, just in case you're gonna be out longer than you think you are, always keep a headlamp in your pack. Filet straps, filet straps to me solve a huge number of issues. They're obviously important if you're gonna A-frame your skis on your pack, but they also solve a wide range of sort of problems with your skis, problems with your bindings. If you need to, you can filet strap your boot together to hold it in if the buckle breaks, anything like that. For more sort of repairs in the field, I have a stubby little screwdriver. Nothing special about this, it's just tiny and lightweight. Comes with a few different bits. Sunscreen, of course, always nice to have. And then I always carry skin wax. In the Northwest, we get, particularly in the spring, really warm, mushy snow. And that mushy snow will stick to your skins. And once it gets on there, it's really hard to get it off. So you rub a little skin wax on there and that sticking will stop immediately. It's, it's like magic. Another thing I always carry, ski crampons. I very rarely pull these out in the winter, December, January, February. It's pretty rare that I'm gonna pull the ski crampons out of my pack, but they weigh very little and it's really nice to have them when you need them. Especially in February, March, when the snowpack's still really deep. If you get a crust on top, you get out of your ski and you're gonna pose tall in up to your knee or even your waist. You throw the ski crampons on, you don't have to take your skis off and boot up that icy slope. And then the other thing I have is a Garmin InReach Mini. Really nice to have as an emergency device, as a personal locator beacon. What I really like about this is it has two-way texting. So if you're in an emergency, you can actually message back and forth with search and rescue. It lets them know what's going on. It lets you know what's going on. Really, really powerful to have two-way texting in an emergency. And the last pieces of gear I wanna talk about are my helmet and my water reservoir. So the helmet, this is the Mammoth Wall Rider. It's a climbing helmet, not a skiing helmet. So you do give up some protection there. Uh, I'm sort of very aware of that, especially when I'm skiing in the trees. A tree on head collision with this helmet would not be great. That said, it's really light. The ventilation's really nice, particularly in the spring. They do now make a version of this with MIPS, the multi-directional impact protection system. MIPS is really nice. It protects your head against some of the rotational forces that can cause a concussion. Most climbing and skiing helmets now have MIPS as an option. Definitely worth upgrading if you're looking to buy a new helmet. And then finally, I'll just talk a little bit about my uh, water reservoir. So I take platypus 
Big Zip Evo. This is a one and a half liter. They make two, two and a half liter versions of this. I really like having a platypus in my bag because I can drink while I'm on the uphill. If you live somewhere cold like Colorado, Utah, Montana, be really careful about when you're taking a platypus because there's a high likelihood your tube's gonna freeze up and then you're not gonna be able to get any of your water. I'll talk a little bit about the clothes I take on a typical ski touring day. And so, again, it tends to be a little bit warmer here. Our temperatures are usually in the mid 20s in the mountains. On the really cold days, they'll get into the teens. And so that's kind of driving what I take. I tend to dress with not a lot of clothing because it, it tends to be relatively warm. So for pants, uh, I just have sort of a generic pair of ski pants. These are from Eddie Bauer. They don't have a lot of insulation. They're not very heavy. What I like about these is that they protect against wind and water really well. And then they have these zips down the side that allow you to open up the pant and get a lot of ventilation in there when it starts getting warm. Really nice to have that option to open up the vent and get some air in there, especially the uphill, especially if the sun comes out. So my upper body, I'm usually wearing just a long sleeve t-shirt, something like that as a base layer. And then on top of that, I'll have the Patagonia dual aspect. I love this jacket. Uh, it's a little bit heavier than Patagonia's R1 for anyone who's familiar with that. Uh, I'm actually wearing that right now. The dual aspect's a little bit heavier. I think it protects against wind and water a little bit better. I can wear this as if it's lightly snowing or lightly raining and it won't soak through. The hood's fleece, which is really nice when it gets a little colder. I usually don't bring any uh, hats or beanies on my trips because this hood's pretty warm and offers, you know, pockets, I can throw my gloves in there, I can throw a phone in the chest pocket. It just works really well for a wide variety of conditions. Above that, I always bring a hard shell. It's pretty rare that I put this on, it's just not super windy in this area. When it does get windy or uh, and a storm moves in a little bit earlier than expected, which happens sometimes, having a hard shell is really nice, uh, keeps you dry. So this is the Arcteryx Beta SV. Any hard shell that works for the conditions where you are, that's warm enough, wind protective enough and waterproof enough for where you go skiing uh, is great to have. And then I always carry a big puffy down jacket. This is an older model from Outdoor Research. I like to carry the uh, down jacket with me because it's an emergency layer. Obviously, if it's a colder day, I might actually wear it, but most of the time it's just sitting in the bottom of my pack. But I really like knowing it's there that if uh, you know someone gets injured or we have to stop and do some repairs to skis and we're gonna be standing there for an hour or two or longer, being able to have a big down jacket in your bag that you can pull out and throw on and stay warm, really nice. The other thing I have here are gloves. I tend to bring at least three or four pairs of gloves on most days. I get really cold hands and the snow here is pretty wet, so you touch your gloves to it and all of a sudden they're just soaked through. The ones I'm wearing most often are just a pair of running gloves. These are from Saucony. They work well in a variety of conditions. If I sweat into them, they dry out fast. If I touch them into the snow and they get wet, they dry out fast. They're not super insulated, so I can wear them on the uphill and just throw them in my pocket when I don't need them. When it gets a little bit colder, I have Hestra's Army Leather Mitts. These are you know, pretty beefy gloves. They take up quite a bit of space in the pack, but I really like having this warmth, especially someone who has cold hands. Fleece on the inside, leather on the outside. They protect really well against wind and water. And so that is it for the gear that I take ski touring. All of this, it looks like a lot when it's spread on the table. It doesn't even take up half of my 45 liter pack. In the spring, I'll have a lot more gear, you know, rope, ice axe, crampons, that kind of stuff. And then I'm starting to fill this pack up. But in the uh, winter, I'm usually touring with just this stuff and have plenty of extra space in there. Great if you want to throw in a beer for the end of your tour or some extra food. That's what I take on a day of ski touring. And uh, yeah, let us know in the comments if you have any questions and I hope to see you out there.